I, I you know I never dreamed that uh, you know a tweet would would send sterling up by 0.8 percent <laughs> but that that is a terrifying yeah thing to be to have you know uh, I saw somebody tweeting that they had a get rich scheme for you on the back of that it would end your journalism <laughs> right, exactly. career but. I mean luckily I had bought a hundred thousand pounds in sterling <laughs> just that morning Welcome to Ireland Unfiltered. This week's show is a special uh, extra Brexit episode, the show you've been waiting to do for a long time, because this week's guest is Tony Connolly, RTE's Europe editor, um, a man who can move currencies with a single tweet, whose stories have kind of led the way on uh, on Brexit for, you know, since this saga began. Um and who has uh, been at the forefront of, of, of the whole uh, situation. Um, he came in on, on Thursday evening. We're putting this out on Friday uh, because it could, it could date so easily. Even as we, after we left the studio, Tony looked at his phone to see that Boris Johnson is going to ask uh, MPs to back a pre-Christmas election, something we considered during the interview. Um, and we talked about where the Brexit deal goes from here, what will happen, um, uh, the EU's attitude to how Britain have conducted negotiations and what it all means for Ireland, not just in terms of the peace process, because that seems to have been settled in terms of there won't be any border on the island of Ireland, but uh, the relationship Ireland had with the UK within the EU, which was a very important one, something Tony has written about before. So it's uh, a fantastic uh, uh, honour to have Tony in the, this week and it's a timely and important episode. Tony, you're very welcome to Ireland Unfiltered. Thank you very much. Uh, this is a Brexit special, um, which we're very excited about, although I think most of our shows turn out to be Brexit specials at the moment. It's the topic that everyone is talking about. I uh, I saw a tweet this morning from a, a, a head of comms for an Irish MEP and it just said breaking, Tony Connolly RTE spotted in Brussels airport. <laughs> busted. Either, busted. <laughs> Either nothing is happening or something is happening. Now this is what was happening. Yeah. You're on your way this here. Is, this is why I'm here. Yeah. yeah. This is why I was at Brussels airport. Yeah. <laughs> but so is that what you're getting a lot now? Like you, what is happening with you and your, your sort of nexus with Brexit at the moment that, you know, when you tweet something, uh, currency, you know, current sterling went up last week when you tweeted uh, about the deal. Like, this is an extraordinary time for you as a, as a journalist. It, it is extraordinary. And it's, it's, an, it was entirely um, not, not planned, uh, or there was no, no, there was no great strategy. But just, I, I suppose, by degrees, uh, there, there were a few reasons why my work for RTE just became a bit more prominent. Mm. Um, I mean, I think, I think the big thing is that I, I broadcast in English, uh, yeah. And so, so there's a natural um, permeability of, of of my work just through through uh, through the media, through online, mm. and uh, and and by extension through Twitter. Um, like when Brexit happened, nobody really anticipated Ireland being the the epicenter of the problems of Brexit. Um, and because I was an Irish broadcaster in Brussels, uh, you know, I, I was at the the cool face of the kind of material or the, mm. or the stuff that the negotiations would be getting into. And of course, then once people realized the impact that was going to have on Ireland and the mm. fact that Ireland was inside the camp and Britain was going to be outside the camp, Ireland was going to have this sort of privileged position, then, you know, I, I was just in a in a particular apex of, of different circumstances that meant what I was doing was starting to get noticed. Mm. Um, and perhaps I, perhaps being an Irish journalist, I didn't have the baggage that, that a lot of British journalists have when it come to, comes to reporting the EU. Uh, so I, I just started to get a bit of prominence. I started to write longer pieces on the RT website. Mm. Um, and then it was on the basis of that that I got commissioned to write the book uh, Brexit in Ireland. Mm. Uh, and that, had, that kind of forced me into a plunge pool of... Of, of all the detail and politics of Brexit and the Irish question and the, the diplomatic response of Ireland. Mm. So um, I suppose by uh, by the middle of 2017, I was starting to get a bit of traction, to get a bit of notice mm. uh, as somebody who knew their stuff. Um, and then the more that happened, then the more 
I found that it was easier for me to get access to the people who mattered in Brussels and then and then London as well because of course I have to report on the yeah. British side of things so um, so it got to a point where you know I, I was just getting more and more credibility and mm. um, but I, I you know I never dreamed that uh, you know a tweet would would send sterling up by no point eight percent but that that is a terrifying yeah thing to be to have you know uh, I saw somebody tweeting that they had a get rich scheme for you on the back of that it would end your journalism <laughs> exactly. career but. I mean luckily I had bought a hundred thousand pounds in sterling <laughs> just that morning uh, so um, but uh, but that's uh, you yeah, I suppose it's just one of those weird things of Brexit, you know, that yeah. that, that that has come up. And you, were, when did you first go to Brussels? Was it 2000 and 2001, one, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I went to Brussels. I, I was just a reporter in Dublin, uh, although I had been one of the pool of reporters who was always pushing to do foreign news. Mm. And uh, so I got a bit of experience in in places like Kosovo uh, and uh, in, in Rwanda, Angola. Um, you know, I, I was sort of trying to create a bit of a profile on foreign reporting. Mm. Um, I'd, I'd actually gone for the Washington job a year before. Um, Carol Coleman got that job, mm. obviously. And then um, then the Brussels job came up and, and, and I got that. But it, I think it was right after 9-11. So, uh, right. so so that was the kind of shadow over which uh, I, I went to Brussels. And then you became the Europe editor in 2011. Is that, is that right? Yeah. So yeah. Uh, I was there initially with Sean Whelan. There mm. were two of us. And then Sean went back to Dublin. So then I, I kind of just moved up. Um, um, and uh, I, Paul Cunningham was with me for a while, and then and then uh, he left, and I, I've been on my own uh, ever since. And was it like you you talked about uh, British journalists there, and how you know being English speaking, but not of that cohort with the kind of traditional Euro skepticism, you might have been uh, more trusted. But what was that like at that time? Because you know one of one of the key narratives leading to the Brexit vote was this drip drip of euro skepticism in the media uh, when you're an english speaking journalist when you're there like how what what was your perception of the eu when you got there and how did it alter and and like how affected were you by what you heard like so the english media how, how they covered it yeah i mean it's funny um like i i went to brussels just after the nice uh the first nice treaty and of course that went down in ireland so there was mm. you know you were starting to get a lot of pushback against the eu in ireland mm. um uh, and then at the same time, the EU was was constantly trying to say, "Oh, look, we're 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 detached from the citizens. You know, pe- people don't understand how the EU mm. works. We are, you know, there's this democratic deficit. Um, you know, the the numbers of people voting for the EU uh, from the for the European elections is, are falling." And there was a real concern at that time in, in Europe about about this, deta- this sort mm-hmm. of dis- disconnect between the citizens and the EU project. And that was why they negotiated the European constitution, uh, because they had 10 new countries coming in. Mm. The way the EU was working was starting to get very cumbersome. It was a very sclerotic, bureaucratic. People didn't fully understand it. And the European constitution was supposed to you know, solve all that that problem. And they they brought as many stakeholders as they could into these big meetings called the European Convention. So you had, obviously you had had ministers, you had had MEPs, but you had had trade unions, Mm. you had lots of civil society, everyone trying to contribute to this fixing of the EU's problems. Um, And they they came up with this EU constitution and it Mm. was rejected (laughs) at the first opportunity by by the French and then then by the... um, by the du- by the Dutch, so as long as I've been in Brussels, there there has been this anxiety uh, that people don't get the EU, um, they're they're distrustful of it. Um, but then, as you go around different countries, some countries like it, some countries are, are very mm. supportive of it. Germany and France, obviously, the big countries that that were the founders, um, and so on. So so that was kind of always in the background when uh, you know by the time. Um, the Brexit referendum came along. Mm. But I suppose the, the big other defining moments were the Greek debt crisis yeah. and then the migration crisis. And there just seemed to be these huge, big elephantine crises mm. that, that seemed to sweep everything in their path. Um, so there was always there was obviously a big sense that something was just 
not really right. Mm. Um, and I think that, that obviously fed into the referendum. Um, but then when you actually looked at the issues that were coming up in the referendum, a lot of them were not really to do with the EU or, or, no. or, or were not to do with... Um, well, the issues seem to have, in Britain, the issues seem to have transferred from uh, anger with the EU now to anger with their own parliament. So it doesn't look as if it was anything focused on the EU necessarily, just at, at power somewhere other than certain people feel where it should be. So that seems to be the case. Something yeah, happening. I mean, I think I think certainly by the time the Brexit referendum came around, uh, you had a couple of years of, of really biting austerity, mm. the, the Cameron Osborne years. Uh, I think a lot of people felt that. You had, uh, of course, as well, a lot of inward migration from uh, Eastern Europe, uh, th mm. and that was part of the deal of, of the of the enlargement, which actually Brit Britain supported. I mean, Britain Britain was one of the big supporters of enlargement because they felt that if you make the organisation wider, that stops the deepening of it, mm. uh, and and they felt that these new countries like Poland uh, and uh, Hungary and so on. Um, that they were kind of kindred spirits. They they were pro free market, pro American. Yeah. Um. So so that was the irony. And then of course, when when a lot of these people began to arrive in the UK to work, I mean, remember it was it was only um, Britain and Ireland, I think Sweden and Germany, who let them all in to work immediately. Mm. A lot of other countries had uh, staggered that. Yeah. So um. So but there was obviously a backlash from certain communities who who felt uh, that that uh, the these EU migrants were, you know, taking jobs or taking a housing or, yeah. or, or, you know, putting a strain on the NHS. Um, you mentioned the rejection of the EU constitution there. Is it correct to say then that that had a direct consequence in regards to the ultimately Cameron calling the in-out referendum because he had wanted the next treaty to go to a referendum? And is it correct to say that because of that, the EU then decided that they weren't going to kind of put things up to, they weren't going to make changes through, through treaties again. Well, the, the, when, when the EU constitution went down, when, like, what they did was they, they salvaged uh, large parts of it mm. uh, and then they repackaged it as the Lisbon Treaty. Right, um, yeah, yeah. And, and then I think, yeah, I think you're right. I mean, I think Cameron um, was under pressure to, to turn that into a referendum issue mm. in the UK and uh, that, that didn't happen. And then he was under relentless pressure from uh, Eurosceptics in mm. his party. Um, and they, so, so on that basis then, he, he was ultimately pushed towards uh, trying to renegotiate Britain's membership mm. of the EU and then put that mm. uh, to a referendum. So all of this can, can be traced back. I think you can trace it all the way back to the Maastricht Treaty, to be honest, yeah. uh, you know, when, when the single currency came in and uh, there were a lot of other changes that were regarded as uh, more handing over of, uh, of sovereignty. What was your feeling covering, uh, you know, the Brexit referendum from Brussels? Like, how did you, did you get any sense? Because again, looking, reading your book, uh, you know, uh, that sense, that sort of surprise that people were filtering, that was mm. filtering through, that this was going to go the other way. Like, did you pick that up at any stage? I think maybe towards the end. Um, I mean, it, it, we just have to look back at the, at the sort of sequencing because the it was, it was clear from David Cameron that he wanted to renegotiate the, 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 the Britain's terms mm. of membership. Uh, there was a famous speech, a Bloomberg speech in 2013. But by the time he actually got around to trying to to, to pitch to the EU what he wanted uh, changed, like he wanted a, an end to free movement. Mm. He wanted things that the EU just weren't going to give. Uh, that was uh, around the autumn of 2015. Mm. Um, and everybody was then focused on, okay, what what's he going to get? Uh, and then it was only February 2016, like only just four months before the referendum, that uh, what was called the February settlement was, mm. was agreed. So... Um, things started to happen very quickly. And of course, all the opinion polls suggested that there was going to be a a, a comfortable remain vote yeah. originally, but then that, that gradually got whittled down. And then and then you had the extraordinary election, uh, referendum campaign in the UK where, where vote leave were just a lot more simple in their messaging, mm -hmm. take back control. The, the Cameron campaign was constantly trying to catch up with the agenda that was being set by by the leave campaign. Mm -hmm. You had you had some very questionable advertising, the, the famous 
picture of of the of the migrants mm. who were actually mostly Syrian refugees, mm. uh, nothing to do with uh, the EU's freedom yeah. of movement. Um, so you, you had this constant sort of slipping and decline of, of the Cameron mm. agenda. And then as, as we got closer to the referendum, it was funny because in Brussels, you would meet people who had been in London for the weekend, or I mean, you, you can pop over in the Eurostar very quickly. Mm. And they were coming back and saying, you know, like I met my sister and her boyfriend is going to vote leave and, and her, her cousin mm. and her workmates. And, and there was all this anecdotal stuff coming back um, that, w- that, w- that was starting to kind of alarm people in Brussels. Mm. So like coming up to the referendum itself, it felt like, yeah, it's going to be close, but you know, probably it'll be a remain vote. But in the end, mm. <laughs> it went the other way. Yeah. And where were you? Were you covering it in Brussels that, that evening? Yeah, I mean, I was, I was covering, I mean, I was doing more and more reporting um, on the referendum. And I went up to Rotterdam to the, the to the port to talk to people there to see how, how were they mm. viewing the whole uh, Brexit referendum. Um, and how, you know, like there, there were different kind of war games for what, what would happen. Um, and I remember, yeah, on the day of the referendum, I was just doing a few reports sort of setting things up. How were people in Brussels anticipating things? And I remember that night there was a, an extraordinary thunderstorm. I mean, the, the sky had mm. turned this weird kind of orange amber color. And there, I think there was flooding in London as well. Um, and it had this very portentous sort of yeah. feel about it, and there were there were a number of uh, of kind of referendum watch parties going on. I, I dropped into one pub for for a drink, and then just went home. And uh, I was I was I was sitting up watching Newsnight like everybody else. Mm. And then after Nigel Farage conceded defeat, I, I just went to bed. And, right. and then and then the next morning at, at five o'clock in the morning in the morning, my wife is a Danish journalist, and she mm. has a very early deadline. And she just shouted up, you know, honey, they're out. <laughs> and I was staggering out of bed. Couldn't believe it. Yeah. Um, and then everything changed. Um, and what was the mood like among um, British officials in, in the EU? Because you've touched upon it there, but like there was, uh, unbeknownst maybe to a lot of people in Britain, there was a great kind of, you know, the, the UK within the EU were a kind of great driving force for a lot of things, the single mm. market included, which are so desperate to get out of now. Mm. Um like, what was the mood among them when when this result came through? Well, uh, you know, the, the the UK have, like every other member state, they have, they have a big presence in Brussels. Mm. Uh, it, it's um, each member state has what's called a permanent representative, which yeah. is basically an embassy to the EU. So, so that's kind of the glue between um, between Whitehall and 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 the EU machine. Uh, it's called uh, OCREP, or mm. the UK representation. They had a party the night of the referendum and um, they, as the results came in, I mean, they were starting to realise not only had all the hard work that, that they'd been doing because they'd been feeding all the stuff back to number 10 mm. in terms of messaging, in terms of what how important it is for the UK to stay in the EU. Uh, not only had all that work seemed to be sort of thrown back in their faces, but they had lives in Brussels. They had yeah. families in schools and uh, some, some were in tears. Um, and in fact, the um, the Foreign Office sent a team of councillors over to, to Brussels to to try and help uh, people come to terms really? with um, with the result of the referendum. And in fact, there were the exact same councillors that had been sent over to counsel people after the Brussels terror attacks, okay. which of course had just happened a few months beforehand. Right. So it was, it was that severe for them? Yeah, it was very severe and... You know, the the UK system was highly regarded in Brussels. Mm. The It's a professional civil service. At all of the council meetings and ministerial meetings in the European Parliament, the British side were regarded as very professional, very well prepared. And in fact, the Irish side often depended on the yeah. UK to have all the uh, preparation done, all the research done. And uh, of course, everything was in English mm. and uh, on taxation on the single market. Ireland was actually right behind the UK and I think depended on them quite a lot. Well, that's something I want to get to because it is uh, um, one of the kind of pr- overlooked things. And as I said, I was reading your book this week again and I was struck by a line which seems kind of quaint now that in 2015, the EU officials awarded Ireland a gold medal for the country most sympathetic to the UK. 
Uh, yes, that's which, right. Yeah, which is a kind of an extraordinary thing yeah. when you look at what 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 has happened because yeah. of Brexit. Yeah. Uh, but as you say, there, like they were uh, the country at that stage, and even post Brexit for five or six months, they were seen as the country that was 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 the one that the UK could probably deal with easiest. Yeah, I mean, the, the, so so when when Cameron was trying to negotiate his his new deal with the mm. EU. Uh, the, the various member states were trying to assess uh, his his demands, and then of course the the demands are going to be granted by the member states. So mm. you know each member state will make the case, and and they 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 put together a a kind of a pecking order of the countries that were most sympathetic to mm. the UK. Um, uh, the 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 Danes were third, I think. The Dutch were second, yeah. and, and the Irish were first. So it's just not, it wasn't an official gold medal. It wasn't an official. official no, this, this, this was a bit of a this <laughs> yeah, was a bit of a parlor game yeah, by, yeah. by diplomats. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I think it was it, it was absolutely accurate, and it was also. Um, I think it was also a bit tricky for the Irish government because both countries were seen as so close on so many issues mm. in, in Europe. Um, I think Ireland had to, felt it had to really reinforce the idea the day Brexit happened or the day the referendum happened mm. that uh, you know we're not leaving uh, as well. Yeah. You know that was the that was the first big right. message that I mean because the whole Irish response was very carefully choreographed. There was mm. an awful lot of preparation. There, there were um, th- three different scenarios had been mapped out by officials. Uh, one, one was a, a leave result, a remain result, and then a, re- a result that was too close to, to call. But the big overriding message was that Ireland was staying, no matter what, Ireland was, was going to stay mm. in the EU. And then w- once everyone tried to get to grips with the aftermath of Brexit, uh, both uh, Ireland and the UK I suppose instinctively felt that they had to come together to to sort this out, mm. um, but then the EU was saying, actually, hang on a second, um, this is not a negotiation between Ireland and Britain. This is mm. a negotiation between the EU and Britain. So everything has to be channeled through Brussels. There was a very rigid kind of adherence to that from the EU at that stage, and, and no negotiation before That's Article right. Fifty yeah. was triggered. Yeah. Do you think they regret that now? Um, I don't think so, because. Um, because the the most important thing was, to, I think the most important thing for the EU has been the unity of mm. of the twenty seven uh, throughout, um, and I think they just had to keep that unity there. And I mean, this was obviously a huge learning curve for the UK mm. because they hadn't prepared for a no vote for a leave vote. Yeah. They hadn't fully understood the European Union either. I mean, the generation of politicians that inherited the Brexit referendum were never intuitively uh, people who understood the European Union. They, mm. they did. They weren't sympathetic to it. Theresa May certainly wasn't a, a, a natural European like, mm. like perhaps Mar- Margaret Thatcher might have been, you know, despite her later yeah. Euroscepticism. Uh, so if, if Ireland, if there had been negotiations before Article 50 was was triggered, then I think that they they would have felt that that would have allowed the UK to pick different right, member states okay. off. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, and in the end, I think the UK just had to go through a very painful learning curve. But does it did it affect like that sense of there being no like that it becoming did it affect it and make it more adversarial? Do you think the fact that it was going to be so rigid or or was it crucial to the way they did things? Well, I think. Um, inevitably, the Article 50 process is adversarial. Mm. I mean, it was drawn up uh, by uh, member states and diplomats uh, going into the EU constitution and then su- subsequently the Lisbon Treaty. It was drawn up to to uh, to give the advantage to the EU, yeah. Um, yeah. you know, not, not to terrify people into not leaving, but, yeah, yeah. but to, just to give uh, the EU the, the negotiating advantage. Mm. So... Um, that 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 was always going to be there, um, mm. I think, um, and and but 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 I think history will judge that the UK was constantly outfoxed and outmaneuvered by the EU because they they hadn't actually done their homework, uh, mm. and because you had people like David Davis, who was the first Brexit secretary, who who somehow thought that he could go to Berlin and get a free trade agreement, yeah. you know, a few a few weeks after mm. Brexit. Um, uh, and again, Theresa May had she had been a Home Secretary, so um, as Home Secretary, 
she had obviously presided uh, at or taken part in many European meetings on, mm. on migration or security cooperation. But Britain had these huge opt-outs from, uh, from what's called uh, Justice and Home Affairs, mm. legisl- EU legislation. And she kind of thought that's how it would be uh, for actually leaving the EU, that you could pick and choose which parts of the EU you liked yeah. and could stay in. So so there was this sort of baked in disadvantage for the UK. And you can see ultimately that the withdrawal agreement that they have finally signed up to uh, is actually pretty similar to what Theresa May uh, had, had to swallow. Yeah. Um, it, you know, the, the only differences really are, are on the Irish question. But, but that, the one that she signed up to is the one she had originally agreed as well more or less isn't it yeah Before i mean the dup in, yes. in, back in 2017 yeah so, so she that. she yes so the the staging posts where you had the joint report in mm. 2017 which effectively created the backstop yeah then that was converted into the the treaty the the draft treaty mm. withdrawal agreement um uh, and as soon as that appeared she said no british prime minister could ever accept this because mm. it put a customs border on the irish sea um, and then she negotiated uh, a, a variation of that, which meant that the whole of the UK was in the customs union. Mm. But then, of course, that alienated huge swathes of her party who th- said, well, that's going to inhibit our ability to have a, a, an independent trade policy. Um, and, and now what they have is, is very similar to the original mm. uh, backstop um, uh, with, with certain key differences. And Ireland's role in this, Tony, because, uh, like... Again, like there was a, sp- a spell when Ireland were ha- sort of looking for technological solutions with Britain to the border back in early 2017, I think, uh, you know, trying to help them uh, assist assist them in some way. Mm-hmm. And then there was a, a, was it a clear change of policy or was it a directive or how did it work where it was decided we're not going to help them? This is going to be a political issue. Yeah. Uh, what 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 was the thinking there? How did that happen? Yeah, I mean, I think this is a fascinating uh, subject, and I was writing about this in the book at the time it was happening. Mm. Uh, I mean, I, I was just tr- the book was trying to catch up with events that yeah. were unfolding each week. Um, but you're right. I mean, when when Brexit happened, both sides were looking at the the problem of the border, the problem of customs and 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 the single yeah. market, and the Irish government sort of saw this as as a as something that had to be fixed um, initially in concert with the, with mm. the UK, um, you know, because these were the two countries that were going to have to sort of manage yeah. manage the border, manage the issues, um, and they, you know, of, officials from the revenue commissioners went off to every single border that the EU had with third countries to see how they managed those borders. Mm. Uh, and the the most uh, famous one was the Norway Sweden border um, because there was a lot of technology involved there. There was a very close uh, political and administrative relationship between Sweden and Norway. I mean, for example, uh, a Swedish customs officer can go fifteen miles uh, or kilometers into Norway and vice versa. Mm. So it's a very close. Um, harmonious operation of, a, of an international frontier. Mm. So that kind of became the model that they were looking at. But at a certain point, um, the, the Irish government saw this and thought, well, well, hang on a second. I mean, what, what we have at the moment uh, gives us free-flowing trade and mm. movement of, of people and businesses and, and goods and uh, and, and, you know, they were seeing the Good Friday Agreement as creating this zone of peace and prosperity. Uh, and if you put a border there, even if you manage it as best as possible, it's still going to disrupt things. So we're going to need a bigger, a bigger boat. Yeah. You know, we're going to need a bigger solution. <laughs> yeah. And it was and it, people have have targeted Leo Varadkar in the British mm. press as having come and torn up the um you know the 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 cheerful uh, hail fellow approach of of Enda Kenny, yeah. but in fact this this um, this change of policy came under Enda Kenny, yeah, um, and and suddenly they were they were telling the revenue commissioners, kind of stop what you're doing or at least uh, pause what you're doing mm. and and we're not going to be publishing stuff because we we have decided that we need a different kind of solution, one that gets us back to the status quo as much as possible. And that was, but so that was something they were seeing it in terms 
more, less to do with trade and to do with the peace process, or was it? Well, yeah, I mean, bigger the, than that. Yeah, even? I mean, it was. They, they were seeing the the island of Ireland as a as, as a as a much bigger issue than than simply trade, because mm. if it's just trade, then you just have you have technical solutions, yeah. um, or you have other kind of workarounds. But um, it, they they were suddenly saying, well. Um, you know, we have these north-south bodies and a lot of these north-south bodies and, and cooperation um, d- depend to quite an extent on the fact that both sides of the equation are operating under the same rules, mm. you know. So so the famous example is like uh, cross-border healthcare. Both sides are using the same, uh, uh, you know, the, the a- mm. an ambulance can go from one side of the border to the other because both both sides are operating the same rules for how long a driver yeah. can keep going. They're operating the same rules for medical devices. Um, uh, they're operating the same rules for recognizing professional c- uh, qualifications. So if you start to pick at the threads of how this cooperation works, mm. then before you know it, it gets disrupted. So they so they did, uh, I mean, to be frank, the Irish government took a very absolutist approach to this. Mm. And the EU said, yeah, whatever you think, you want to protect, you know, we'll protect it for you in the mm. negotiations. Although the, you, in your book, you do li- like the negotiations over, uh, I can't, was it a direct or was it what, what there was about the, a name of the word, the aim of no, no hard border. Yes. In the of yeah. Ireland. That took getting that word in took about three months. So yeah. So, um, w- when article 50 was, was triggered, mm. uh, that sort of starts the clock uh, ticking and you've got two years to negotiate Britain's exit. So Ireland had to get uh, its objectives embedded in the EU's negotiating mandate. Yeah. Uh, so that so basically a month after Theresa May triggered article 50, Michel Barnier got his sacred mandate from mm. the EU heads of government. Mm. Uh, but, but that mandate was, was kind of months in the making and they had to map out all of the priorities that the EU had in, in you know, preserving the single market, making sure that Britain paid its uh, exit bill, mm. making sure that citizens were protected. And of course, the big one then was the, was the Irish question. So the Irish government had to uh, kind of start drafting um, the, those the paragraph that would sort of be mm. the the sort of um, tablet of stone for for Michel Barnier, and um, and you know you look at this and you think well it's just it's just a bit of bit of rhetoric saying you know the EU has always supported the peace process mm. and we're going to do everything we can to make sure it's not uh, damaged, um, and there's a line in there saying um, you know the the EU supports the achievements benefits and commitments of of the Good Friday Agreement. Mm. Now you think that's just emphasis, but in fact. Those three words were very carefully put in there by the Irish government. Um, you know, the achievements were the peace, uh, the mm. benefits were uh, prosperity, the commitments were that this pr- prosperity and peace will last for all time. Yeah. So that they were kind of saying we need this to roll out into the future, and that and it can't be damaged by Brexit, and even the word commitments. Um, other member states were sort of saying well, what do you mean? You know, what are we on the hook for if we sign up to this? Mm. So so these were very precise uh, elements in the negotiations, which were like quite hard fought. And the the, the line that you mentioned there is, you know, the, the, uh, to paraphrase, all sides will do everything they can uh, with the aim of avoiding a hard mm. border. Mm. Um, and that was kind of saying, you know, we can't guarantee that yeah. uh, we're going to avoid a hard border, but we'll aim to mm. do that. Uh, and and as you say, they were scrapping over that word with the aim of. Mm. But, um, you know, the, I think the EU was trying to be realistic there. Mm. But in fact, when, when you look at how doggedly the EU has stuck to the Irish question, um, they did actually, yeah. Yeah. you know, they did go, f- they, they almost went beyond, uh, you know, what, what, what that what that mandate said. Did that surprise you? Like you being there, did you feel that? Because, you know, we... we we heard those commitments, but there was always this sense, especially fed from a lot of media in the UK, that there would come a point when yeah. uh, other priorities will kick in, the the, yeah. the car manufacturers, yes. whatever. Yeah. So did you did you feel they would be as resolute as they were? Um, I I I think I'm I'm surp- I was surprised at how at how uh, much the um, the EU stuck to Ireland on this. Mm. I mean, you're you're right in in terms of the the kind of narrative from the UK media, but mm. also. 
I mean, th- there are constantly journalists coming to to Brussels from from Dublin, and they, they get to meet the institutions. And I'd often go and talk to them. And every time people would say to me, yeah, but you know what that's like, you know, in the mm. end, it's a it's a power game between big countries like Germany and France mm. and the United Kingdom. Ireland will be told, lads, you have to step aside. Uh, but in fact, uh, that, that didn't happen. Mm. And, um, you know, there are reasons why the EU felt that they had to support the rights, uh, not only of a member state that was staying, mm. but a small member state, you know, and I think this was... I mean, I think there was a sense that um, you know Ireland had really taken a bullet, more than a bullet, uh, with the with the bailout mm. and, and the and the financial crisis, and they, they were due some kind of payback. But also, you know, in, in a world of of power politics, of power geopolitics with Russia and China, I think the EU felt it was important to to show that they have solidarity, that they'll support right. uh, smaller member states. And in fact, you often heard it said that um, you know ultimately where the Irish were kind of perhaps pushing for, for a bit more flexibility here and there. Uh, it was the commission that were a bit more doctrinaire um, about the, about the backstop. Right. Um, I think mainly because they, it was, it was protecting the, the, the internal market hmm. as well. You know, this isn't just about yeah, yeah. peace on the island. Uh, it's, it's about the internal market as well. Um, and when you say that Britain, you know, hadn't done their homework, was that one of those areas where you think they expected something to happen that, that didn't happen? Like, on, on Ireland, yeah, and the EU resolve. Yeah, I mean the the problem with with uh, the British approach was that um, B- Britain felt that the the Irish border issue was one that was uh, was about trade, uh, yeah. was about customs, was about uh, uh, regulatory alignment, and they were saying, well, look. Uh, you know, th- there are two treaties we're going to negotiate here. One is just the one that takes us out. Um, the, the second treaty is the is our future relationship. Mm. That's that's where you solve these problems. You know, you, you, like uh, customs and trade and everything. That's a future relationship thing. Mm. Why are we do- dealing with it in the in the divorce? Um, and the EU's answer was, well, basically, we we don't trust you. Like mm. we we think that you could then use the Irish border as a bit of a leverage, a bargaining chip in these trade negotiations. In other words, Britain would be pushing for yeah. uh, frictionless <coughs> access to the EU single market. And and uh, the EU would say, well, unless you're in, you don't have that yeah. frictionless access. And they're saying, well, if you don't give us that access, then what mm. what's going to happen to that little border you have over there with uh, with Northern Ireland? So that was the that was the kind of very uh, dogged approach and rigid approach mm. the EU took, and I think that again that sort of threw Britain off balance in the negotiations. And and they were they were genuinely shocked uh, when in in November two thousand and seventeen, um, the EU came up with this uh, this blueprint for for a, what became the backstop. Mm. Um, I mean, essentially, they were saying, OK, the Irish border might be solved in, in a future trade agreement. It might be solved through technology. We just don't know. But if, if these two solutions don't work, mm. then we need a, a plan. Option C, it was called. Um, and I think Britain really was not expecting that. Um, right. Because um, they had said, you know, in, in a sense, Britain all all summer, like the, the negotiations began in, in June of 2017, and all summer Britain had been saying, of course, we, we'll sign up to whatever uh, we need to to, mm. to preserve um, the peace process and the Good Friday Agreement. But they were saying, you know, we can fix that through technology uh, or uh, trusted trader exemptions, um, all of the things mm. that Boris Johnson <laughs> two <laughs> years later yeah. was, was uh, recommending. Yeah. Um, so... Uh, so when when the, when the backstop uh, appeared, um, and it appeared as as a bullet point in, in a seven uh, a seven paragraph uh, working paper mm. that the that the European Commission circulated to member states, um, very innocuously saying something like, uh, "It seems essential that uh, in order to uphold the peace process, there should be uh, no regulatory divergence between Northern Ireland and and Ireland." Um, and that was the backstop right there. You know, mm. This was like the alignment uh, on yeah, both yeah. sides. Whatever it takes to preserve the all island mm. economy, the peace process, uh, this is what we have to do. Uh, do. Do you think it was ever seen by the EU as a way of keeping the UK in the EU by other means, if you like? No, I, I really don't think so. I mean, this is often uh, put forward uh, by Eurosceptics. Mm. Um, but, you know, th- th- this was... 
this was a, a straightforward case of of the EU supporting mm. uh, a member state. Um, I mean, I, I don't think the EU would ever have, in a conspiratorial way, worked out that if we put this in here, then Britain might change their minds. Mm. Um, because in, if you if you look at the thread of this, the whole idea of Britain being trapped, yeah, in the backstop only came about because the UK, because Theresa May wanted the backstop to become UK-wide. Mm. I mean, initially it was just for Northern Ireland. When she saw what that meant in reality mm. uh, with Northern Ireland staying in the customs union and so on, she said, well, we can't have that. We, we have to have uh, the UK as a whole in the customs union. And again, that wasn't so much only for Northern Ireland. That was also because the big car manufacturers were f- f- constantly lobbying uh, the Treasury, yeah. constantly lobbying Number 10 Downing Street uh, to have some kind of customs relationship with the EU because mm. the, the entire uh, supply chain model, the just-in-time supply chain model that these um, car manufacturers depended on mm. um, was, was at risk if Britain was outside the customs union. So so Theresa May had some self-interest in keeping that there. But but then when the, when the Eurosceptics realised that they could be in there without any clear pull cord, mm. you know, to get out of it. That's when the whole trap uh, narrative took effect. But the original uh, objective was, was simply to try and avoid a hard border on the island yeah. of Ireland. But but the, like, as, as the negotiations progress, I wonder, you know, and you look at the last year um, of May's deal being rejected three times and the evolution of uh, thinking maybe in Brussels or as I watched that from maybe believing that there was a chance that Britain might at some stage you know have a second vote might decide to remain in the EU to a point now where would you say there there's just exasperation with the whole thing yeah I mean I, certainly you know when brexit happened like I not I mean, there was there was an enormous sense of disappointment sense mm. of disappointment in in, in Europe um, at at the turn of events. Um, I mean, this was a time just after Donald Trump. Um, yeah. It was a time of tremendous unease about the migration crisis. Uh, it was not long after the, the Greek uh, and financial crises. So the EU was in a pretty shaky state and there was a real concern that other countries could follow suit. Um, mm. Now, does that mean they were punishing Britain? Um I think that's probably going too far, but mm. they certainly wanted to make it not easy for a country to leave and then get the same benefits. And 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 you can see that that makes perfect sense. I mean, why why would you then have a club if you could have the same benefits yeah. and being outside the club with none of the responsibilities? Um, and as and and then there were others who were just genuinely sad that mm. that, that, that you know one of the the, the you know the great global economies was was leaving um, Britain spends more on defense you you know you had all that that sort of heft it's a member of the security council um i understand that when when the eu was drawing up sanctions for all of those russian individuals uh, who were caught up in in the invasion of of crimea um 77 percent of the names on on the sanctions list came from british intelligence right. so they could see they were they were losing uh, a friend and mm. a real asset um, so I'm sure they would have been happy for Britain to, to change its mind and come back in. But the more the negotiations went on and the more polarised the UK became, mm. um, you, you started to get people really asking the question, I mean, do we really want to kind of re-import this extremely toxic, divided right. kingdom yeah. into the middle of, of the EU again? Mm. Uh, is it really going to be worth it? Um, and I think that view has now really taken taken root, uh, even if people like Donald Tusk uh, and Jean Claude Juncker are genuinely, you know, saddened mm. at, at what's happened. And is there? Would you say there's a, a split, or is it more unified now because Macron or someone would have been firmer on that view going back to the springtime, but it's now more widely held? Yeah, certainly. I think Macron would have would um, have had a perhaps a more uh, self-interested view mm. of, of the UK leaving. I mean, Paris has been has been lobbying nonstop to get financial services companies to move there from London. Um, you know, it, it's uh, it, I suppose Britain's departure 
gives France and Germany, uh, you know, a, a more elevated uh, status mm. than, than they had before. Like Britain was a bit of a counterweight. Uh, so this gives France a bit of a bit more of a free reign. Mm. Um, but, uh, you know, again, uh, you, you've got different countries take different views of this. Certainly in Eastern Europe, uh, all those countries have uh, a huge stake in this because they have so many citizens working and living yeah. in the UK. So so everybody looks at this from uh, mm. from from their own particular angles. And what is, like, we've been in the middle of this for three years, but, like, what is at stake for Ireland in terms of the EU? Like, what does Ireland lose from Britain leaving the UK, or from Britain leaving the EU? Well, first they might of all, leave the UK soon. Who well, knows? <laughs> that's, a, that's another interview. <laughs> I mean, certainly Ireland uh, lost its key ally uh, mm. in in the in the European Union uh, on the single market, um, on on taxation, um, and uh, you know that that is a huge loss mm. for Ireland um, because the way the EU works, uh, you know, the European Commission proposes ideas, then those ideas um, and policies get taken up by the member states and the European Parliament. And they kind of mash it all up and, and produce a, a law at the end of it uh, that everybody can live with. Uh, and for, for key issues like Ireland, for Ireland, like taxation, to have the e, the UK at your side and, and the voting weight that the UK has, because you've got this weighted voting system uh, to, mm. based on population size, um, that, that's, that's a, a significant loss for Ireland. So th- what they've been doing is they've been self-consciously building new alliances with um, with countries like Denmark and the Netherlands mm. and uh, the Baltic countries, countries that are like-minded in terms of the single market, uh, you know, the services directive, uh, you know, a, m- a much more free market uh, ideology, mm. um, uh, keeping the EU away from taxation. Uh, so they, they've been doing a lot of that uh, bridge building. Uh, they call it the bad weather club, which is uh, okay. basically the, the Baltics and and, right. uh, and the Nordics and and uh, and uh, the Netherlands and so on. Um, but again, if you add all those com- countries up, you're still getting quite a small voting block uh, mm. in, in the EU. Um, so it will be something that I like that the, the, they're going to miss, and it'll take a, like it will be a period of readjustment for Ireland. Yeah, it will be. Yeah, um, but you know, already, um, the, you know, Britain's voice has just been declining mm. at, at EU level, and they now have a policy of of the empty chair. You know, they've right. been taking ministers and officials out of EU meetings. So, so Ireland is, you know, I think they are uh, already trying to to boost their profile mm. and. Uh, and actually, um, you know, the, the the backstop has been no harm to Ireland in terms of getting visibility to, mm. to the Irish issue. I mean, so many uh, European summits have been about the Irish question, and yeah. you've had you've had you know diplomats and officials all over Europe kind of pondering the number the levels of milk powder you know uh, <laughs> that's crossing from Artie Garvin in County Tyrone to uh, you know to yeah. a processing plant uh, in 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 the south. I mean, this is the kind of weird yeah. nature of of. Uh, of, of Brexit and uh, you know I, like I've been doing an awful lot of interviews with uh, with uh, foreign media explaining mm. to people what the backstop is mm. and why it's so important and so on so so Ireland is you know for a ver- for a very small country on the margins of Europe we have uh, we end up at the center of things an awful lot yeah. you know with the with the Nice and Lisbon referendums mm. with the bailout uh, and now with uh, with Brexit um what was the mood in our the, our the- expectation in in Brussels when Boris Johnson took over? I mean, I think people were um, a little bit uh, surprised and, you know, a little bit dismayed at at how his rise to prominence was so spectacular in Mm. the Conservative Party. I mean, he had, as Foreign Secretary, he had really annoyed a lot of uh, other member states yeah. in, with some of his pronouncements. Uh, he wasn't taken seriously. He really annoyed the the Germans at one point. He he said things during the vote the, during the leave campaign uh, about the EU uh, and after the referendum that were seen as very uh, insulting. Mm. Um, and he was he had a bit of a toxic brand uh, yeah. for sure. But they also saw someone who uh, w- was a flip flopper who, who mm. could change their change their opinions on a sixpence. Um, who wasn't ideologically driven. Who was who could be a pragmatist. And they they felt perhaps that that was 
bit, a bit of a, an opportunity, um, although hopes were certainly not high. Yeah. Um, and when you look actually at what happened in the lead up to the to the the um, decisive summit mm. there uh, uh, last week, um, he was actually. Uh, uh, embracing his pragmatic side yeah. and he did uh, absolutely throw the DUP under the bus mm. in the end uh, and he now he was kind of cornered by by the realities of, of no deal the realities of how uh, tough the EU were being mm. on, on, on the issues uh, and I think he did eventually get the, the, the real risk to the peace process if you threw a border back on the mm. island of Ireland. Now, obviously, he's going to have his work cut out trying to manage the, you know, the seesaw effect of the other side of, yeah. of, of how loyalists are going to react to the customs border. Is that a danger too? Is that something that's been overlooked in our determination to get the, you know, no border on the island of Ireland, that there is a, a danger too to the peace by a, a border in the Irish Sea? Um, I don't think it's been overlooked. Um, you know, people have been mindful of it, and I and I suppose the fact that the DUP had this um, f- this incredible stranglehold over Theresa May mm. um, that pushed the Unionist viewpoint way up the charts in terms of Britain's yeah, yeah. Uh, negotiations and and its engagement on the issue. And you know, I I talked to um, I, I, I talk to EU officials all the time and, and they were all, you know, uh, highly aware of the DUP uh, anxiety on this mm. and the influence that they had on the on the British government. And I remember talking to uh, one member of the task force who was an ex- extremely important figure in terms of how they managed the Irish issue. And she went up to... Uh, the border with Michel Barnier, uh, mm. uh, I think on his first visit. So the Irish government took him on a visit up to uh, Dundalk. And she, rem- she she told me that, you know, I was standing there and looking across the border and thinking, we need to be in there as well. You know, we mm. need to understand that side of the equation. Mm. Uh, and Michel Barnier did eventually go to, to Northern Ireland uh, and he, you know, he, he did talk to... Uh, to unionists, but uh, I think they always felt um, that they were being overlooked. Um, but you know, when it, when it comes down to it, the the calculation was and is: if Brexit creates a border, mm. it's either going to be on the land border mm. or it's going to be in the Irish Sea. If it's on the land border, you have to manage a five hundred kilometer yeah. border with two hundred crossings. Mm. You know, with a a, a, a closely knit um, supply chain economic model that will be completely destroyed by this border, and you have a you have a border running through, you know, the most sensitive territory when it came to uh, to the, the troubles mm. like South Armagh. The other border is going to be symbolically very difficult for unionists, mm. but it's not. You know the infrastructure is there. It's at ports. You know mm. the, the checks will happen on ferries. So when it comes down to it, this is a brutal calculation as to which of these borders does the least damage. Yeah. Uh, and and I think that's where the things have have landed. Well, the solution for to the DUP's problems now is membership of the EU. That would solve that would solve all the problems. Yeah, absolutely. And and that and that's I mean, I think only now is is the DUP realizing what mm. exactly this is uh, is about. And of course, they're saying that this rides roughshod over um, the whole question of consent. Mm. Um, the trouble is that if you if you make that argument, then the counter argument is well, where was the consent for Brexit in the first place? Yeah. Uh, and and that's a hard question mm. for them to answer, um, and you know because you know Brexit is such a brutal, you know, political reality that it comes down to these very fundamental questions. You know, yeah. well, you want consent now, but you were happy to deny consent at the time. Mm. So, <laughs> you know, this is the <laughs> yeah, hard yeah. political cheese that 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 you're handing to people. But and also just the the kind of the for all its faults the. Um, the, the magic of the, of the EU, if you like, that it could accommodate all these things, like the and again as you say, the DUP's lack of foresight that this this entity set up to temper all nationalisms, yeah, uh, allowed all of them to be accommodated in a flu- yeah. in a fluid kind of yeah. in a fluid group, and, yeah. and when you break that, 
individual and English nationalism is now betraying Ulster unionism. Yeah, well, this is it. And, and uh, it's, it is really fascinating to see how the Conservative Party, uh, you know, when Theresa May came out to the House of Commons, the, you know, the same day that the withdrawal agreement appeared in its first draft, mm. which which said quite graphically that Northern Ireland would be part of the territory of the EU Customs mm. Union. I mean, you can't you can't use the word territory like yeah. that, uh, yeah. even though the EU thought they were being very neutral and, mm. and pragmatic about this. Um, the number of unionists, uh, sorry, the number of conservatives who declared their unionist colours mm. uh, what was extraordinary. <coughs> there, was, there was something like um, 47 uh, Tory party members who were publicly on the record as saying that they could not accept uh, the backstop um, because it it put Northern Ireland on a different footing to the rest mm. of the UK. And 47 of those 48 Conservatives voted against uh, the mm. withdrawal agreement when it first happened. But, you know, a year later, they have all dropped their, mm. their objections yeah. uh, because they have seen, they've been given a choice, either you're going to get Brexit, Brexit over the line or you go for supporting the union and they've gone for Brexit. Mm. And you, you hear people saying, well, you know, um, like the, just because Northern Ireland is under different rules, it doesn't mean it's any, any less part of the union. Mm. Uh, but that was not the uh, original uh, posture of the UK government when the backstop appeared. Um, and the Irish government were, were furious at this because they said, well, you've been talking for months that you would never want another hard border on the island of Ireland. But like, mm. what did you think was going to happen? Yeah. Uh, and, and you've turned this into a constitutional crisis, not not uh, not anybody else. Mm. And what do you think, uh, like we, you talked about Boris Johnson there and being a flip flopper. How much of it of the, of the deal as it was done came down to... Uh, chemistry if you like or the fact that there was a you know he was able to make a deal in a way that that Theresa May wasn't because you even at the summit I saw him sort of laughing and joking with Tusk and Juncker and Leo Varadkar and they previously and the thing that unlocked the whole uh possibility of the deal was um Liverpool Liverpool yeah, yeah. um like is like you everyone talks about the EU being a rules-based organization mm. all that how much would you say as some sort of personal connection had a bearing on it well, it's funny. I mean, um, it, it is somewhat ironic in the end that it did come down to a kind of a bilateral fix mm. between Ireland yeah. and the UK. Uh, but, but having been told they couldn't, do, yeah, exactly. Couldn't yeah, do but but in the end, it, it was a bilateral fix within the framework of of, of the withdrawal agreement that mm. had been negotiated. Um, and it is an extraordinary historical moment. I think that meeting in Liverpool, because who would have thought? That uh, you know, Leo Varadkar and Boris Johnson would have been able to to hit it off mm. and, and to find a chemistry to get this over the line, um, especially when you know, like we all remember the the image of the two of them on the steps of government buildings yeah. when they first came over, and the contrast between them looked so physically so different, mm. um, and their personalities are, are completely different. Um, but uh, what I'm told is that they they both actually got on well together. Mm. They they. They, they both kind of were relaxed in each other's company. Um, I mean, perhaps Boris Johnson is actually very enjoyable to be around. I mean, he is, mm. he is funny, he's entertaining. And perhaps that was the that was the kind of icebreaker that the he process also needed. Yeah. He also desperately needed well, the exactly, yeah. to like him. Well, that's true, yeah. And that's the other side of <laughs> yeah. this whole discussion. Um, Boris Johnson's options were kind of closing in. Yeah. Um, he, I think he realized no matter how people remember him for his promise to eyeball the EU and, and uh, mm. into, into submission and to die in a ditch rather than extend beyond the end of October. Uh, all of that uh, chest beating that, that accompanied his arrival. Um, in the end, I think he realized that no deal was not going to be pretty. Mm. Um, and he also realized that um, he, he, he wasn't going to be able to have a customs border uh, on the island of Ireland. Mm. So the run up to the Liverpool meeting is very interesting because, OK, they had they had already met twice, uh, once in Dublin, once in New York. They'd had a couple of phone calls. The British side was really they were really far apart. I mean, mm. he was still talking about a customs border on, on the island of Ireland. Uh, OK, you could have all island alignment on, on agri food and animal health. Um, but you know he he was he was far apart. 
Um, and then that week of the meeting, you had this briefing to the spectator that mm. Leo Varadkar had uh, overplayed his hand. He'd broken his promises. Then you had the briefing on the phone call between Angela Merkel mm. and Boris Johnson. And actually, Irish officials going into that meeting were very nervous that it was going to be uh, a humiliation. Um, uh, first of all, they were scrapping over where to have the meeting. There was one suggestion it was going to be in the Isle of Man, right. <laughs> of all places. Okay. Uh, Boris, Boris <coughs> Johnson didn't want to come to Dublin. Leo mm. Varadkar didn't want to go to London. So in the end, they had it in Liverpool, and uh, which is Irish territory. Which is know, Irish territory. Remain, yeah. It also voted remain yeah. in, in the referendum. Um, but uh, I think it was partly the the chemistry between them. But I think going into that meeting, Boris Johnson realised his his his, uh, his options were running out, hmm. and he made the big step forward, which was okay. I accept that Ireland cannot have a customs border on the island. There can't be any customs border on the island. We're going to have to shift everything to the Irish Sea. Mm. And then Leo Varadkar accepted that Stormont was going to have to have a meaningful role mm. in how this was managed. Um, and one f- one final piece of the jigsaw was that um, because the original backstop was f- built on this idea that a free trade agreement would sol- solve the Irish question because it would it would be one of high alignment, mm. which is what Theresa May had, had uh, believed in. Boris Johnson came along and said, no, we don't want high alignment at all. We mm. want a, uh, an arm's length free trade agreement mm. like Canada. Um, so once Boris Johnson had signaled that, the backstop wasn't going to work anyway. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so once those two big steps had been taken, um, it, it allowed both sides the space then to actually get things moving. Mm. And it was almost like the idea is, okay, if we take these two big political steps, then the rest are, are technical fixes mm. that we can just get officials to just kind of um, grind their way through. Mm. And and we've got like two weeks to do it. And, and in the end, that's what happened. Although the the politics of it at the other end was was not fully anticipated which is the DUP mm. still you know, holding out against this how did you feel when Arlene Arlene Foster tweeted uh, about EU sources uh, at that moment was there any panic uh, no absolutely not because um, because the sources that I that I use when I'm in Brussels I mean like you have to cultivate sources in in, Mm. you know in the member states in the Mm. institutions in Britain in Ireland in Belfast uh, and the sources I use I I absolutely trust Mm. Um, and um, usually like my most sort of valued sources I I would I would have to ring or text Mm. um they they will often not text me, uh, so I have to I have to go pushing for people mm. uh, to to find out what's happening. And on this occasion, uh, I actually got a text. Was that while you were on news at one? I was on news at one. Yeah. I was on air when I yeah, received I the text, the, yeah. and the text said, um, uh, "Things are looking good. Game on." Mm. So the person who sent me the text, I phoned immediately after the the news at one and said, "So what's happening?" And I was told that the DUP had uh, had had dropped their their objections mm. on, on the consent question. Um, now, something like that, um, like I, I, you always need a second source. Yeah. So I got two other sources um, who, who confirmed it. And then I saw what uh, what Arlene Foster had said. Now, th- it kind of bothered me because it came directly from, from Arlene yeah. Foster's account. And, you know, there, there there is kind of form here because because I broke the story back in 2017 of the whole regulatory alignment thing mm. that, that that was in the joint report and the DUP were actually being briefed on the joint report when they saw my tweet uh, and that was what prompted them to walk out it was a terribly <laughs> awkward well, moment well for me you know <laughs> thanks thanks a lot kind of thing uh, and, 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 uh, and yeah they, they, that, that was what sort of set the rot in and, and they said you know we did these, because the problem was that Theresa May wasn't briefing them fully as to right. what was what the what the direction of travel was so um, what I heard afterwards was that Arlene Foster was was really annoyed that RTE was putting this out, and they felt it was part of the pattern going back right, to, okay. to to 2017. That that uh, no, um, <coughs> obviously I wouldn't say you know who, who the sources were, but uh, on all these occasions, I have said before that mm. uh, you know these are not Irish sources. I mean, the, the Irish are not leakers. I can I can say that yeah. for sure. Um, and then I, I followed up with my my original source once this tweet from Arlene Foster came out, and uh, I was told, look, um, the, the source said, look, I now have it from two people in the room, hmm. the actual room where the negotiations were taking place, uh, that the UK had said, uh, if this is tweaked, uh, the DUP are on board. 
Right. Uh, and that was the basis of, uh, and that tweak was done, mm. uh, and that was the basis of uh, a sudden flurry of optimism. Uh, but somebody had got their lines crossed mm. somewhere. Um, and anyway, ultimately, you know, I, I'll stand over any story that, that's mm. put out, but I'm, but I'm, you know, I'm reporting for Brussels. You mm. know, I'm reporting what EU sources are, are telling me. Yeah. Um, the deal was the deal was done. It just wasn't. The deal was done. The yeah, DUP but the but the DUIP yeah. actually. I mean, in, in yeah. a sense, Arlene Foster was right, but but mm. but but EU sources were 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 also right mm. in that this is what they've been told by the British side. Um, no, I mean, maybe in the fog of last minute panic negotiations, mm. stuff always gets uh, short circuited or stuff gets uh, misunderstood. Um, but uh, yeah, in the end. <laughs> It was. Uh, I mean, I wasn't worried about it because I had, I had complete faith in, in the contacts that I had. The deal is done, um, but what, as as a man in Brussels Airport, wanted to know, like, what is happening right now? Do you think? Well, t- so today, uh, so it's it's Thursday today. So um, w- what's happening is that the EU has to figure out what to do with this extension request. Mm. And the the um, the request obviously come in from Boris Johnson through gritted teeth, as we know. Uh, but that request is for an extension to the end of January. Um, now, on the UK side, the extension is horribly uh, entangled with whether or not Boris Johnson should go for a, an election, mm. an early election, whether he can still try and get the withdrawal agreement bill through the House of Commons. Um there's a whole psychodrama going on with Labour, with the Liberal mm. Democrats, with the Scottish Nationalists. And the EU is kind of saying, do you know what? Like, we're just better off not getting involved. Mm. Um, so they have to decide to grant the extension or not. And they have to decide if they're going to grant it until the end of January. Mm. Um, so they may well just say, you know, to take the, the sort of safest, most neutral option, which is to say, OK, you've asked for an extension until the end of January. Uh, you can have it. Mm. OK. Um, and then on that basis, then Boris Johnson will have to decide whether he goes for an early election or not. Um, but uh, that that's really what's happening. Um, and will let you, so you think, because Macron is still, is again, is pushing for a much shorter extension. Yeah, I mean, the French historically have been very sceptical of long extensions. Mm. And uh, he, uh, I mean, so there was some briefing from uh, Paris that th- they would want an extension of only a, f- a couple of uh, weeks. Mm. Um, but, you know, I don't think anybody wants to uh, create a situation where there's a there's a crash out because, you know, the extension hasn't yeah. been long enough or, or the, the, the the election hasn't happened or the, the legislation isn't through the House of Commons. So so nobody wants to take the blame for, for a no deal. So, mm. uh, you know, I think that the, the French made it made their point last time around. I, I would my guess is, although I could be wrong, that they will uh, they will row in behind a you know a, a January 31st extension but then that only really works then if he does go and have or the only real chance of getting that through then is if he then goes and has an election well um I mean the the the, the extension simply mm. pushes the pushes everything out to the end of January um but you'd have to have an election pretty soon you'd have to have an election in December to kind of do that with me well he could either try and get things through. He could try and use the extension to get the withdrawal agreement yeah. through the House of Commons. Um, now he might, you know, because there's an extension there, um, and and people have a bit of time to to play mm. with. They might, you know, Labour might try and hook on uh, amendments right, yeah. that that could really screw things up, like mm. a second referendum or uh, staying in the customs union. Um, and in that case, he could say, right, I'm just going to go for a, a general election. But again, in order to get the general election, he has to get Labour to play ball there as well. Ooh. And then, um, so he, he doesn't have a lot of time to to actually figure out when the election happens. Yeah. I mean, to, there are three methods to, to have the election, um, all of which mean that the, the, the actual dates for an, a general election are quite limited. Uh, I mean, there's there's uh, 5th of December is w- one date that was put he up there. Can't have it, he can't have, have it after December 12th because all the holes are being used exactly, for a nativity yeah. place. <laughs> exactly. Uh, yeah, or, or, you know, people saying, you know, British politics is a pantomime. Well, it, it might literally be a Christmas <laughs> pantomime by that, by that stage. So, and then the, the other trouble is that if he, if he goes for the end of, or if he goes for an election in January, um, and then Britain uh, sort of technically leaves at the end mm. of January. Then uh, the transition period, which is a kind of a keeps yeah. everything the same, it, it it expires at the end of December. 
Uh, and when do the negotiations about extending that begin? Yeah, so, well, they have to decide if they want an extension to the transition. Mm. <laughs> the jargon's tripping me up here. <laughs> if they want to extend the transition, they have to do that by July. Right. So, and 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 they don't. that's just not like a, an email to Brussels. Yeah. The, the, there's a whole other range of stuff that they have to work out, most notably money, because the 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 thirty nine billion uh, pound exit bill is based on on uh, an, a transition that ends at the end of twenty twenty. Mm-hmm. So if they want to stay in for another couple of years, then the EU is going to say, well, you're going to have to pay whatever yeah. ten billion a year. So you, can you imagine Boris Johnson winning an election and then being straight into another horrible wrangle mm-hmm. with the EU about money? And explain one thing to me, if there's a talk about Britain crashing out with a no deal in December, if that isn't extended, crashing out in December 2020 with a no deal. But that no deal only would apply to Great Britain. Like There would be no, no deal on the island of Ireland. Exactly, yeah. yeah. So because we're all assuming now that, that the withdrawal agreement is, is approved mm. and, and that they have a successful uh, orderly Brexit, as, as, as they say, uh, probably by the end of January. Mm. Um, that means that the, the Irish question, be, because the backstop has been taken out yeah. and replaced by this new thing, that means that uh, it's all, uh, we go to that point directly. Okay. Um, so all of those arrangements are legally binding and in place. Mm. Uh, what, what that means, though, is that um, whereas Northern Ireland will be operating under the rules of the customs union and single market, mm. um, you know, we won't have uh, any customs or border or regulatory controls on the island of Ireland. Um, it just means that the rest of the UK will be crashing out, yeah. uh, you know, pretty potentially. much potentially. Yeah, yeah uh, but Northern Ireland will be largely within the the ambit of, of the EU. Um, you talked at the beginning about sloganeering and in, in elections. Do you think that's kind of ongoing? Because you hear, you know, let's get Brexit done, and when you lay it out there, it, this isn't getting done. No, any, any it's not too. at all. No, no. Uh, as someone said, it's like it's like saying. Uh, no, I I can't take credit for this, but I don't know who said it. But it's like saying, I just want my the, the birth of my child to be over and done with, so I can go back and uh, you know enjoy <laughs> clubbing and uh, all of that. I mean, this is no, this is uh, this is a a ten year process, you know, yeah. because the. The the, the 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 free trade negotiations can't start until there's been an election, hmm. um, and and then they have to start uh, a trade negotiation, which will take years. I mean, there's hmm. just no doubt about that. Um, uh, and especially if 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 the UK want a um, a Canada style arrangement, then okay, that that just means you're abolishing tariffs, uh, not all tariffs, but then. Like a huge amount of uh, the UK economy, perhaps a majority of the UK co- economy by value, is in services. Mm. So um, potentially, then they're going to cut off services to the EU uh, single market. But and then, if in the middle of these trade negotiations they decide they want actually to have access for services, then you have to have a whole conversation about. Uh, alignment mm. about uh, following the rules of the single market, about having the European Court of Justice have having jurisdiction over how that works, uh, and all of that is going to take time. And well. That all has a huge impact on on Ireland economically as well. Like the peace yeah, process course, is yeah. protected, but that is yeah. still something that yeah, of course, yeah, and and you know, um, uh, you know, there there's a huge amount of. Um, uh, of of there's a big services economy between mm. Ireland and the UK in legal services and uh, financial services derivatives and so on, um, and if there is that arm's length trading relationship between the UK and the EU, then that's going to be a problem for Ireland. Um, so all of this is going to be uh, you know worrying people for a mm. long time. Tony, you've left your phone unattended for about an hour now, so I think we'll wrap it up before you know the the, the fate of Europe depends on you checking your messages. Yeah, thank thanks you very, very much. much. Thanks a lot. Pleasure. Hope you enjoyed that special interview with with Tony. Um, before we go, don't forget to subscribe to Ireland Unfiltered on all the usual channels, and if you like the show, please leave a review.